Amy Kiger of, of uh, Region 8 Council uh, for Family Support Planning Council. So we appreciate you all being here. This is such an important topic. Um, we've had several parents who have had um, recent issues with their benefits, their child's benefits changing because of their status, whether their, their uh, spouse passed away or became disabled. And so it's just such a complex um, system to navigate. And we just wanted to get some more information. Uh, so the our council is a support group for families who have loved ones with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Uh, we meet on the second Thursday of the month um, via Zoom at seven o'clock. We are Region 8. We cover Gloucester, Salem, and Cumberland counties. So we try to be a resource. We're kind of like that liaison between our parents and our state family support planning council. Uh, we try to bring the information down from the state for our family. So if you're on our email blast, you see we send out lots of information. And um, we also, if we, you know, we try to help brainstorm and bring resources to our families. And, and if um, we're struggling to do that, we bring those issues up to the state level so we can get more support. So we um, thank you all for being here today. And I am going to pass it on to Mr. Connor Griffin from the ARC, and he, he's going to give an uh, intro of himself. So thank you so much for being here, Connor. Thank you, Melanie. Good evening, everyone. My name is Connor Griffin. I'm the Director of Healthcare Advocacy with the ARC of New Jersey. For those who don't know, the ARC of New Jersey is the state state's largest advocacy organization for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. My healthcare advocacy program advocates for quality health care for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities across the state of New Jersey. And tonight I'm going to be presenting how parents' social security benefits impact their adult child with IDD. So I'll waste no time and get right into the presentation. So here are some of the main topics that are going to be discussed over the course of this presentation. We're going to talk about New Jersey Family Care, the state's Medicaid program, as it refers to the unwinding or renewal process. We'll be talking about when a parent is planning to start collecting their Social Security retirement benefits. Why SSI for your son or daughter changes to SSDI. What Social Security's official definition of a disabled adult child or Section 1634 DAC looks like. The New Jersey Workability Program, which is one of the newer Medicaid programs under New Jersey Family Care. ABLE accounts and why Medicare, not Medicaid, starts for persons with IDD, that is someone with an intellectual or developmental disability, begins after 24 months or two years after they both start receiving SSDI. So we're gonna start with the Medicaid unwinding or the renewal process. So just in case this is something um, you're not aware of that's been discussed ad nauseum the last year and a half, the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic in March of 2020 resulted in the federal government declaring a public health emergency or PHE, which resulted in continuous Medicaid enrollment. And by continuous Medicaid enrollment, I mean that over a three year period between March of 2020 until April 1st of 2023, there was continuous enrollment in that no one was being removed off of the Medicaid program and they were not doing ongoing renewability checks. So you got to stay on Medicaid, regardless of under normal circumstances, you had been eligible. And that was a great thing during the pandemic to make sure everyone was covered. But the federal government ended this PHE period. And since April of last year, each month, one twelfth of New Jersey Family Care Medicaid enrollees were receiving a renewal application. So at this point, it's been over a year. We're starting to move through the unwinding out of the, the initial renewals. But at this point, we're coming back around to if you're someone that renewed earlier last year, you might already be coming around to your next annual renewal. Because now on an annual basis, New Jersey Family Care will be doing renewals as they were prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. 
And it's very important to note that I always stress everyone with IDD, they must continue to have Medicaid to keep their Division of Developmental Disabilities services. Now it's important to note that the unwinding did not apply to one specific population and as individuals who have SSI and Medicaid. So what should you do if a loved one has New Jersey Family Care and Medicaid? This is still in effect. Usually you don't wanna exceed Medicaid's maximum allowable resources. For most individuals, especially if you're someone that has SSI as well, this is usually going to be $2,000 a month. Now there's an exception. If you got approved for SSI, someone sometimes receives a large lump sum back payment from social security. If this happens, don't, pa don't panic. You don't need to spend it all down in one month. This can be a rather large sizable um, source of income. You have up to nine months to spend that amount down to under the $2,000. If needed, if you can't spend down the whole amount, I'd strongly recommend considering an ABLE account if appropriate. And you wanna make sure this is for the Medicaid unwinding and moving forward with renewals. You wanna make sure that Medicaid has a current mailing address. If you're unsure or you think your mailing address might be outdated with New Jersey Family Care, you can call their main number 1-800-701-0710 if you wanna confirm that information. So when it comes to the Medicaid unwinding and renewal process, you of course want to respond promptly to all letters from New Jersey Family Care, failure to respond or provide the necessary information that's needed. This can result in termination from Medicaid, which as I mentioned prior, this could jeopardize DDD services. If you're notified by social security that a loved one's current SSI and Medicaid will be ending, do not delay in submitting the necessary paperwork to Medicaid. For information on Medicaid unwinding, we have information on our website. Sign up for our group email list at arcnj.org and make sure you visit my healthcare advocacy program at the arcnjhealthcareadvocacy.org. So now I'm going to move into the next section. What actually happens when a parent is planning to collect Social Security retirement benefits? So Social Security for parents' full retirement age is going to depend on when you were born. So if you were born between 1943 and 1954, or 19, yes, 1954, age 66 is going to be that full retirement benefit for the employee. If you were born between 55 and 60, that age increases gradually beyond the age of 66. 1960 and later, you're looking at age 67 for a full benefit. Now, if you want, you can collect Social Security as young as age 62, but there's a penalty. This can result in a reduction in benefit. Whereas if you wait all the way until age 70, there is an increased benefit. So it's really going to depend on your individual circumstances, what you're comfortable with, you know, if you are looking to continue working. And it, if you're wondering more about this and seeing, you know, what might be the best age to retire, or, you know, when can I collect my full benefit? On the ssa.gov website, they have helpful tools that you can use to really, you know, estimate, see what it looks like for you and help you, you know, make that decision for what future planning looks like. So, what is the difference between SSI and SSDI in case someone doesn't know because these terms get thrown around quite a lot and you might not know, you know, what is SSI versus SSDI. So SSI is supplemental security income. The determination is based on having a severe enough disability and very limited income and resources that that $2,000 monthly resource limit I mentioned before that applies to the SSI program. SSDI is Social Security Disability Insurance. This is based on Social Security's determination of a disability as well as work credits. A Section 1634 DAC or Disabled Adult Child is an adult child who receives SSDI via the parent's work record. And I'm going to talk more about this. So sometimes son or daughter has SSDI and they never had SSI. So 
if a parent collects Social Security retirement, becomes disabled, or in the tragic event that a parent passes away before their child with IDD turns 18, it is very likely that the child is not going to be receiving SSI. There are some circumstances where if the individual under 18 might qualify for SSI, but when a child is under the age of 18, Social Security looks at the entire household's income and resources when determining eligibility. So many individuals don't often qualify. So in the event that someone's getting a Social Security benefit under 18, it's likely not SSI. So if younger than age 18, the Social Security the child receives is either going to be that SSDI, which is calculated on the parent's work record, or in the event that the parent passed away, it is referred to as a survivor's benefit. So what happens to SSI and Medicaid for your son or daughter when a parent starts to collect Social Security retirement benefits or when a parent becomes disabled or they pass away? So as I touched upon before, the majority of adults who are age 18 and older with ID, they have SSI and Medicaid. It's, it's very common. When a person has SSI, it's important to note they receive Medicaid automatically without a separate Medicaid application. So this saves some energy for a family. If they apply for SSI when their child turns 18, they get approved for SSI. They'll get that monthly cash benefit and they'll automatically be enrolled with Medicaid. So you won't have to worry about filling out a separate New Jersey family care application. But then after this happens, there are often changes to the son or daughter's SSI and Medicaid when the parent, again, either decides to start taking retirement, becomes disabled, or passes away. So there have been some changes between how it used to work and how it works now. So when a person with IDD had SSI and then one of these three events happened, the parent retired, becomes disabled or passed away, it used to be through Social Security that the switch to SSDI and what I'm going to call DAC status was automatic. So if they had SSI and they become eligible for the SSDI, that was an automatic switch and, and the Medicaid was automatic. Now it's a bit different. Parents are usually being told by Social Security that a new application must be submitted before this DAC, this disabled adult child status takes place. I've heard reports of denial for DAC status because someone didn't have sufficient information that was provided to Social Security to essentially prove the disability status prior to the age of 22. So this is why it's very important. You wanna make sure you're saving all medical and IEP documents from when SSI is initially approved. So all this needs to be gathered initially when you're doing that first time SSI application. Once your child gets approved for SSI, you know, make sure you're storing this information away. You know where it is, you have copies on hand because it's very important to be able to furnish later if you have to do this reapplication process for your child to become an eligible DAC and start receiving SSDI instead of the SSI. So this is something important to note. If your son or daughter needs DDD services, then once again, they must have New Jersey Family Care or Medicaid. There can be some confusion out there that some families are under the impression that they, they need SSI or they need Social Security to qualify for DDD. This is not true, but they do need Medicaid for the DDD. Whether you have it through SSI or you have it through a different pathway, you need some form of Medicaid. So, when SSDI starts, again, those resources cannot exceed $2,000. This is a Medicaid rule, not a Social Security rule. Families should be aware that Social Security employees, they may not know that New Jersey Medicaid is required for DDD services, and do not pay attention if Social Security say there's no resource maximum for people who receive SSDI. While it's true that SSDI doesn't have its own resource maximum, there is a resource maximum for New Jersey Family Care Medicaid, even when the child switches from SSI to SSDI. So please keep that resource limit in mind. So 
Social Security's official definition of a Section 1634 DAC or disabled adult child. So first, why is it helpful to have SSI? So when the parent of a person with IED retires, becomes disabled, or passes away, if they have SSI, they're able to receive SSDI income on the parent's work record instead of SSI. This is helpful because the monthly SSDI in many cases is going to be higher and it often exceeds the Medicaid income limit. The maximum county Medicaid income limit for 2024 for a single individual is about $1,250 a month. When a person with IDD previously had SSI, they are considered a disabled adult child under Section 1634 of the Social Security Act. They are eligible to requalify for Medicaid after they start receiving SSDI on a parent's work record. And it's important to note the amount of the SSDI benefit is ignored. So even in the instance where the child transitions from SSI to SSDI, they start receiving a monthly benefit that exceeds what would typically be the Medicaid monthly income limit, they're still able to qualify because they have this unique DAC status and the amount is ignored for the purposes of being treated as income by New Jersey Family Care and Medicaid. So what is the official definition? So again, a DAC is a disabled adult child and I'll you'll see in the next slides, I've attached it, the section 1634 DAC flyer which was developed by the New Jersey Department of Human Services. It was last revised in 2021. But here is the official Social Security Administration definition of a DAC. So it's a person who is receiving SSI benefits and by extension Medicaid, and they meet the following criteria. They're at least 18 years of age. They have blindness or a disability that began prior to the age of 22. They had been receiving SSI based on that blindness or disability, and they have subsequently lost SSI due to the receipt of Social Security benefits on a parent's record due to the retirement, death, or disability of a parent. Once again, I know I keep stressing this, but it's very important. The person cannot have more than $2,000 in resources in his or her name. This excludes exempt resources, such as in a special needs trust or ABLE account. I'm going to talk a bit more about those later in the presentation. Here is the New Jersey Department of Human Services DAC flyer that I mentioned. This is a very helpful flyer. It's available on the Department of Human Services website. It's available on the ARC of New Jersey Healthcare Advocacy Program page. This is something that's very helpful. You're going to want to look through it. If, you know, if you're a parent that's thinking about retirement and housing and affect my child's benefits, this is a really good flyer that describes the process and what it looks like for making sure there's no lapse in Medicaid coverage and that your child remains enrolled. Because not only do we want continuous Medicaid enrollment for you know the very important healthcare services they receive, but also to make sure those DDD services, if applicable, those keep on going. So how it looks a little different for someone who is enrolled in DDD versus someone who might not be enrolled in DDD. So I'm gonna start with an individual who's enrolled with the DDD supports program or the community care program. So DDD will send the New Jersey Family Care aged, blind, disabled, Programs Request for Information Packet, the RFI packet, in a blue envelope, which includes instructions about where to send the completed form. It's important to complete this packet as soon as possible and return it as instructed. After your packet is reviewed, which might take up to 90 days or three months, you will receive a final determination letter. If you do not receive the RFI packet, you're gonna to wanna to notify your DDD support coordinator. This RFI packet is the DAC Medicaid application. So if you're going through the DAC process, your child is switching from SSI to SSDI. Once they've switched to SSDI and you've received a notice that SSI is terminating and you've received a notice that Medicaid is also going to be terminating, 
if you don't receive information about an RFI packet within a week or two after this has occurred, you're going to want to be reaching out to your support coordinator. They can usually supply the RFI packet. If for any reason there's difficulty, you're always welcome to contact me. But you want to make sure you're getting this RFI packet in a timely manner. You're completing it because the sooner you get it in, the sooner it gets processed and you avoid any possibility of there being a lapse with your child's um, Medicaid coverage. For individuals not enrolled in the DDD supports program or the community care program, the overall process looks fairly similar. Just instead of DDD and a support coordinator, the local county board of social services should be able to send you that New Jersey Family Care ABD RFI packet. Same deal, in a blue envelope, you're gonna to wanna to complete the RFI packet as soon as possible, return it to the County Board of Social Services instead of DDD. And after your packet's reviewed up to 90 days, you're looking at hopefully getting a final determination letter. If you do not receive the RFI packet, again, fairly soon after your child's switched from SSI to SSDI, you received those termination letters, you're gonna to wanna to be outreaching your County Board of Social Services. And I've included a link here on the slide that takes you to the homepage where if you're not exactly sure what your local county office is or where it's located, it has all of them throughout the state. Here's an example of the form that's sent by DDD when a person is changing from SSI to SSDI. So you can see it mentions a lot of the same terminology that I've mentioned, a uh, request for information. Um, and you know what information they might need to make sure that the Medicaid transition is smooth and there's no lapse in coverage. Make sure you're submitting it all on time, and then you know hopefully if there's no changes, things will go on just as they were before, and you won't have to worry about your child not having Medicaid for any period. So some important things when applying for New Jersey Family Care as a DAC, I've interchangeably mentioned New Jersey Family Care and Medicaid, they are the same thing. Some notifications, they might say New Jersey Family Care, while others might say Medicaid. New Jersey Family Care is the state Medicaid program. They are interchangeable. Also, the first page of the Medicaid application for a new DAC, again, it needs to say request for information or RFI. You don't want to just go online and submit a regular ABD application, you want to be doing the RFI because sometimes you won't need to submit all the information. It's not like processing an all new Medicaid application. So you want to make sure you're doing the RFI and not just going and submitting a regular new ABD New Jersey Family Care application. Also, very important to note, on page one of the application, it asks if the applicant needs long-term services and supports, such as dressing, bathing, or mobility assistance. The answer is going to be no. A yes answer can lead to a huge problem in delaying Medicaid approval because by checking yes, New Jersey Family Care or the county office might consider the individual for managed long-term services and supports or MLTSS. And this results can result in a denial because the person doesn't qualify for that nursing duty level of care that is a requirement for the MLTSS program. So for most cases, you're going to want to say no if this doesn't apply to your child. When applying for Medicaid, when SSI Medicaid is ending due to the parent's retirement or the disability or if they passed away, son or daughter with IDD, they cannot have more than $2,000 in resources with a few exceptions. So they might have funds in an ABLE account, which for 2024, you can deposit up to $18,000 per year in an eligible ABLE account. You can have the funds in a special needs trust. And again, if you got approved your SSI and there's a large lump sum back payment that's received from Social Security, nine months to spend down. And what I mean spend down, that means, you know, using on eligible purchases or putting in an ABLE account or putting in a special needs trust. Very important. The previous Medicaid from SSI, that coverage is typically in effect for about four months after SSI ends. So that's what I mean when I'm talking about uh, SSI and Medicaid are ending due to the transition from SSI to SSDI. 
there's a period where even after you receive that termination letter from the state, from Social Security, which can be quite frightening, I know, there is still a period where despite the termination, you're going to have a couple months where coverage continues and it will be by a certain date. If you don't do anything, then the actual coverage would terminate. But if you're doing, as I've mentioned, you're going through and getting the RFI application, you're filling it out, you're submitting in a timely manner, then there should be no problem with getting it processed and making sure that the Medicaid can continue and there's not going to be a termination for your son or daughter. Now, I talk in the scenario where SSI changes into SSDI, there are some circumstances out there where someone does actually end up keeping SSI and SSDI. They receive them at the same time. And that person doesn't necessarily have to go through this DAC renewal process for keeping the Medicaid. So I'm gonna provide an example here of someone who can have SSI and SSDI simultaneously. So person with IDD receives SSI and Medicaid at age 18. Later, a parent with, say, a small work record retires or becomes disabled. For the sake of the example, the parent receives, you know, very modest $900 per month in Social Security benefit. The standard for a child who starts to receive SSDI based on their parents' uh, retirement or disability, it's usually 50% of the parent's amount. So the, the parent receives their amount and the child receives their amount. So in this scenario, the child with IDD would start to receive SSDI, half, 50% of $900 is $450 a month. So the person with IDD will receive a reduced amount of SSI, as well as the $450 a month in SSDI. In this situation, the person with IDD, they keeps their Medicaid from SSI because their SSDI doesn't exceed the SSI maximum. So... They keep the SSI, though it is reduced, and they'll keep that original Medicaid. RFI Medicaid is not applicable in this situation. So really, only it's going to happen with the RFI Medicaid situation if you receive that termination, that SSI is ending, and that Medicaid that came with the SSI is ending. If you keep some SSI, you keep the original Medicaid, then this wouldn't apply. But in most cases a child starts receiving an SSDI benefit that is going to be too great to also keep SSI, but there are some circumstances. So to talk about one of the other resources that might be helpful for that spend down or staying under the $2,000 resource limit, a special needs trust is something that is a very powerful tool. You want to go to a special needs attorney who is very experienced in setting up this type of trust for the Medicaid beneficiary. If the special needs trust has been funded, Medicaid will want to review the information. So please be aware of this. You'll have to furnish uh, information about the special needs trust if you're going you know, through the DAC process or you're going through your annual renewal. And whenever there are expenditures from the special needs trust, you want to save all receipts and follow Medicaid regulations. Some people with IDD who are employed have New Jersey Workability Medicaid. So uh, to go over the New Jersey Workability Program, for those who might not know, as this is fairly recent, the New Jersey Workability Medicaid expansion, phase one went into effect last April, the same time as the unwinding began. And what it does is it allows for the continuation of New Jersey Workability for up to 12 months after job loss through no fault of the employee. So with workability, one of the contingencies is usually the person has to be employed, but if there is some job loss, coverage may continue for some period of time, though it's not necessarily going to be 12 months. It just can be up to 12 months. One of the biggest things about the phase one expansion was that resource and asset limits were eliminated. So someone under the New Jersey workability program doesn't necessarily have to worry about that $2,000 resource limit because there are no longer those limits associated with the program. You can also keep New Jersey workability after a 65th birthday. There used to be an upper limit on the uh, an age cap for the program. They got rid of that. They removed consideration of spousal income. And you can now have an IRA or 401k retirement account. This is not new. This was already allowable, but 
it's still something important to highlight. More recently, phase two went into effect February of this year. And now the program is open to people age 16 and over who have a disability determination. Again, no longer counts spouse's income when determining eligibility or premiums. No longer limits eligibility based on those resources or assets. And now no longer limits eligibility based on income. So this is another major change that helps more individuals become eligible for the workability program. But those premiums I mentioned before, if there's someone with countable income over 250% of the federal poverty level, they must agree to pay a premium. And you can see the Division of Disability Services website for the full premium chart and information about the workability program. There's also information again on the Arkham, New Jersey Healthcare Advocacy website. But so these are major important changes for the workability program, removal of the income and asset limits that help working individuals remain on the program and still have access to that Medicaid coverage that can be very important. So, so important to know when a son or daughter with IDD receives SSDI and is employed. So even though workability might not have income or asset limits, there's some other important things that you're going to want to keep in mind. So this is SSA's regulation that to be eligible for SSDI benefits, a person must not be able to engage in substantial gainful activity. What is substantial gainful activity? Well, Social Security essentially interprets it as, you know, that you're working meaningfully and you're able to wait, work and be employed and earn wages, earned income. So a person earning more than a certain monthly amount is usually going to be considered to be engaging in SGA. The SGA maximum, it usually increases some each year. For 2024, it's $15.50 a month gross income. And again, SGA is income from employment, that earned income, wages, salary. It does not include SSDI income. So if you're someone that switched from SSI to SSDI, you're getting it, even if you're getting it from a parent's work record, that does not count towards that monthly SGA limit because that SSDI benefit is seen as unearned income, whereas SGA is looking at earned income. You're going to want to report income from employment monthly to SSA to make sure they have up-to-date information. If an employee with IDD receiving SSDI exceeds SGA for nine months, as there's usually a nine-month trial work period where someone might be able to exceed that limit and still receive the full SSDI amount, if they do this for more than nine months, expect to have SSDI halted and there can be a letter from Social Security that requires payback for overpayment. And if someone continues to exceed SGA beyond that point, usually the SSDI benefits are cut off. It's important to note as well that SSI, SSA can be very delayed in sending notifications when someone with SSDI exceeded the SGA level. So, you know, it's something to be very careful about, be very cognizant of, you know, where your child, if they're working, you know, what does their monthly income look like? Are they coming up against that SGA limit? You want to keep it in mind because if you start exceeding that amount on a regular basis, SSA can be very delayed in issuing a notice and you might be on the hook for a large overpayment. So something to keep in mind and be very careful about. Now I'm going to talk some about ABLE counts as another option for resource spend down and remaining eligible for Social Security and Medicaid. So just a little bit of background, the ABLE counts were established through the Achieving a Better Life Experience Act of 2014. Uh, like I had mentioned a bit earlier in the presentation, persons with disabilities can deposit up to $18,000 a year, and that's for 2024, in an ABLE tax-exempt savings account. The amount recently, it's usually been going up a bit each year, but um, as of right now, I can't say what 2025 might look like, but for 2024, it's up to $18,000 per year. Um, for eligibility purposes and opening an ABLE account, a person must be receiving SSI or SSDI, or if they're not receiving either, they must meet SSA's definition 
of having a disability and the age of onset of disability must be before 26. So a little different from the, uh, the, the DAC that a disability must be prior to 22. For an ABLE account, it's prior to the age of 26. After SSDI starts, if there's, say, difficulty in spending the additional money, which, again, sometimes there's sometimes there's a large lump sum payment or the person all of a sudden, you know, has a modest SSI payment that they're receiving on a monthly basis and they start receiving a much larger SSDI benefit, it might be difficult to spend the money down. Opening an ABLE account to help manage those expenses can be extremely helpful. ABLE accounts won't affect continuing financial eligibility for Medicaid, Social Security, or some other public benefits. So money you keep in an ABLE account, you know, even if it's over $2,000, those are considered exempt resources and they won't affect Medicaid, they won't affect Social Security. So it's important though to monitor the ABLE account statements just as you would any other bank account. You really want to monitor the monthly ABLE statements with a debit card, a credit card, you really, really want to stay on top of it. Treat it as you would your regular bank account. If you see unauthorized purchases, you're going to want to report it to the bank. They're able to investigate and the account holder is usually reimbursed for any unauthorized charges. So to continue about the ABLE accounts, you might be wondering, how do I open it? So you can do so. It's fully online. So don't look to go to your in-person bank and do it, you're going to open the ABLE account online. That's the quickest and easiest way to do so. And you actually do have the flexibility to open a New Jersey ABLE account, which many people opt to do, or you can technically open an ABLE account in a different state. So I've included a link here, savewithable.com for the New Jersey ABLE, but you could also visit another great resource is the ABLE National Resource Center for state-specific information. They have great webinars and state-by-state -state comparisons. Essentially, the ABLE account um, you know, features of them differ somewhat state-by-state. State. So one state might work better for you than another. Um, some of them, for example, have different you know, maximums you can put in there because uh, if you put more than a certain amount in there, what can happen is, again, while Medicaid or SSI or other programs they won't be terminated. Um, sometimes if you exceed a certain amount in the ABLE account, um, like for New Jersey, if it's you exceed 100,000, what happens is uh, if someone's receiving SSI, SSAI payments are halted until the balance goes under 100,000. But again, won't be terminated from the program, just payments are halted. So something important to consider. Another critical piece of the ABLE accounts is that upon the death of the beneficiary, the state in which the person lived may file a claim for all or a portion of the funds in the ABLE account to recoup costs paid by the state while the beneficiary was receiving services through the state Medicaid program. This is commonly known as the Medicaid um, payback provision. And, and this is something that states are mandated to do. They don't necessarily have a choice and they may recoup some or all the all the costs associated with Medicaid after the beneficiary passed away. So something also to keep in mind with the ABLE account. So now I'm going to get into Medicare and persons with IDD. So it's very important to note that if a parent is age 65 or older and collecting Medicare, this is not going to automatically result in their child with IDD also having Medicare. It works a little bit differently. So after a person with IDD has been receiving SSDI for two years, 24 months, Medicare will start automatically. So you don't have to worry about submitting an online application or going onto the Medicare website. And there's two main ways for a person with IDD to have SSDI. It's going to be from the work record of a parent who collects Social Security retirement or disability or the parent has passed away, again, that results in that survivor's benefit. Or it's going to be from the person's own work record. If they've, you know, some individuals with IDD, they work long enough, they've paid into Social Security, they paid those taxes, and they're able to qualify based on their own work record. When a person has both Medicare and Medicaid, Medicaid pays for the Medicare Part B premium. So a person with IDD they won't receive Medicare without having SSDI for two years or turning 65 with that sufficient work record. 
So having both Medicare and Medicaid, which is commonly known as dual eligibility. So you can have both Medicare and Medicaid at the same time with an aged, blind, disabled type of Medicaid. So the Medicaid programs that I've mentioned over the course of this presentation, they are of the ABD variety, New Jersey Workability, the DAC Medicaid, the SSI Medicaid. These all fall under the umbrella of the aged, blind, disabled type of Medicaid. So if you're on that type of Medicaid, you're eligible for the Medicare. And again, DAC Medicaid equals ABD Medicaid. What you cannot have is both Medicare and Medicaid with the non-ABD New Jersey Family Care. This is uh, the Affordable Care Act expansion Medicaid that um, certain individuals do qualify under. This is just based on someone's monthly income and doesn't track resources, but that form of Medicaid has no ties to an individual being older or having a disability, so it's a bit different. If someone happens to be under that form of Medicaid, the person would need to switch to an ABD Medicaid program before they become eligible to start receiving the Medicare. But the majority of individuals with IDD, they have an ABD type of Medicaid, especially if you started out on SSI when the person turned 18. So Medicare Part B for dual eligibles. Without Medicaid, so for the average person, the cost of Medicare Part B premium was just under 175 a month in 2024, this was a slight premium increase from 2023. Uh, Medicare and Medicaid enrollees, those duals, the New Jersey Medicaid program pays the cost of the Medicare Part B monthly premium. So if you're an eligible dual, you wouldn't have to pay that monthly premium. In 2024, the state and Medicaid will pay for it. But something important to note that sometimes when an individual first becomes eligible, they start getting those Medicare benefits. What can happen for the few, first few months is that the Medicare premium that will be deducted from the Social Security benefit. So the person's SSDI benefit, you might get notice from the Social Security Administration that, you know, that Part B premium amount is going to be deducted. And this is not something you get stressed out over. This happens a lot that there's not that immediate transition where Social Security recognizes that the individual's, um, you know, an eligible dual and the premium gets paid for by the state. This issue fixes itself automatically and the deduct deducted amount, anything that's taken out by Social Security towards paying that Part B premium, Social Security will reimburse the amount. Sometimes it just takes a few months for this to, um, for everyone to get on the same page, essentially. Now, what about private health insurance and Medicare Part B? If you have private health insurance, as many individuals with IDD do, commonly through a parent who might have commercial private health insurance through their employer, suggest not declining Medicare Part B, even though the person with IDD has that private health insurance. Once again, Medicaid pays the Part B premium. It's not like in circumstances where someone's turning 65, they might still be working, um, have employer insurance, and they want to delay the Part B um, Medicare because they want to pay the monthly premium. But for an eligible dual, Medicaid pays for the Part B premium. So even if you're not going to use it, say you're perfectly happy using the private health insurance, you might want to just keep the Part B because it's not something you have to pay for. It's not coming out of your pocket. So just something to keep in mind. Now, what happens if Part B was turned down because of private health insurance and then the private insurance ends? When ready to start Medicare Part B, the parent who had that health insurance, they must have a letter from the employer documenting continuous, credible coverage from the date when the person was first eligible to have Medicare Part B, but they refused because of the private health insurance. This is to avoid that late enrollment penalty, which is what happens um, if someone doesn't enroll right away. Now, Medicare Part D, which is more commonly known as the drug benefit, it's mandatory for a person with Medicare and Medicaid to have prescription drug coverage and it either must be provided through Medicare Part D or it has to be credible drug coverage through a private health insurance plan. It's not seen by Medicare as sufficient. Even if the person was happy with prescription drug coverage they were previously getting under the Medicaid program to have just prescription drug coverage through Medicaid when they become Medicare eligible. It has to either be through Part D or it has to be credible coverage through the private health insurance plan. 
If you're happy with the drug coverage under the private plan, you can opt out of Medicare Part D. I include the phone number here. You call 1-800-MEDICARE and you can do so. It's also important to note that the Ark of New Jersey, we typically do an annual webinar each November on Medicare Part D for the upcoming year, so 2025. And the slides and recordings, if you're uh, curious about last year's webinar, which you know covers the changes that went into effect this year, you can find them on our website. But that webinar come November, we'll have important information about um, what to expect in the upcoming 2025 year. We also have three fact sheets, which are very helpful and help you understand what happens when a person with IDD becomes eligible for Medicare in addition to receiving that Medicaid, because again, a dual can have both. You can have the Medicaid and Medicare. The first one is uh, just frequently asked questions, dual eligible is general information. The other one specifically talks about prescription medication and what the options look like. And the third covers the dual eligibles and special needs plans or DSNPs, which those are a unique type of Medicare Advantage Part C uh, plan that's uniquely available to dual eligibles. And that's something that can be used to get, you know, some supplementary coverage for certain eligible individuals. But those are available on our website. Encourage to check those out as well. Lastly, very important continuation of a parent's private health insurance after the age of 26. So protections under the Affordable Care Act, all young adults can remain on a parent's health insurance until the end of the year in which they turn 26, so until December 31st. But adult children with disabilities may be able to remain on the parent's plan beyond age 26 if they're not capable of self-sustaining employment. At least a few months prior to the child's 26th birthday, Parents going to want to contact the employer's human resources department about getting the necessary documents to ensure and see if the child is able to continue beyond 26. Also, it's it possible to have private health insurance, Medicare, and Medicaid. In this situation, Medicaid is always the payer of last resort, whereas depending on your insurance, either Medicare or the private health insurance might be primary. But it's important to note, because I know there can be a lot of misconceptions out there, a person with IDD, they can have Medicare and Medicaid at the same time. They can have Medicare, Medicaid, and private health insurance at the same time. Many families do. And again, we also have another fact sheet on our website that talks about this continuation beyond age 26, if you have uh, more questions. I also wanted to, of course, include my contact information here. Um, if you want to reach out and you have any questions that you can answer during this presentation or during the Q and a, uh, feel free to send me an email and I'd, I'd be happy to help you. But that is my presentation for tonight. Thank you so much. There is just so much information to absorb in this. Um, and I've sat through this several times and I'm still like getting bits and pieces of it. So really appreciate your time with this. Um, one comment I have um, to that last point you you made, if you have, because my daughter has private insurance, Medicare and Medicaid, and she just turned 27 this past week. So when she turned 26, just make sure if that's your situation, make sure you let the private insurance know that they are disabled and can continue on. Our insurance dropped her. And then she was with, we we didn't have, we had like that, that community plan where it was like the Medicare, Medicaid together and not separated out, um, which her doctors didn't accept. So now we have separated those out. So now she was able to get back on the private insurance um, and they backdated it to when they dropped her. Um, but we also separated. So she has regular Medicaid, Medicare, then Medicaid. Um, so that was just our situation. So I just wanted to let people know, just make sure your private insurance knows that they have a disability because somebody yes. didn't check a box. A absolutely. And dental, and, and, yeah, dental and vision too, because they dropped her too, which was separate from the medical. So yep. just, I live and learn. We have a lot of really good questions here. So are you ready? Sure. Um, yeah. so the first one, I retired this month. My son was diagnosed with autism at age five. He was receiving SSI since he was 18 years old. 
will my son's benefits, including SSI, Medicare, et cetera, be revoked? Will they be reduced? Well, uh, she wrote uh, revoked as- Oh, re revoked. Oh God, yeah. I'm sorry. They, it's very likely they might be. And then that's where, you know, if they become eligible for SSDI instead of the SSI, what happens is social security will notify you. You know, this follows the parent's retirement and they will notify you about doing that new application for the SSDI. And then after that point, you would find out definitively if, you know, with the SSDI amount, they become eligible for, if the SSI will be terminating if that happens, then you're going to be looking at that DAC, uh, you know, Medicaid reapplication process um, that you're going to want to go through to make sure that Medicaid continues. Okay, and our next one, um, this is going, a couple of these are going back to um, the Medicare application, the family care application. So it took them several months to approve the renewal. I was due again in September. The approval was in May. Never received a renewal in September. Has my date changed? It, it might have changed. I know I've heard of circumstances with over the past year with the renewals that some applications have been taking a bit longer, especially with the county offices. So it might be that the date changed or it could just be, you know, with having to do all the unwinding last year, renewing all the members, it definitely seems like, you know, the county offices have still been playing catch up and it, sometimes it has been been taking a bit longer. So, but if it, if it seems like it's really taken beyond that three months, you know, that's something I'd encourage, you know, you, you can contact me to really reach out and see if something else is going on there. Because un unfortunately, the reality is sometimes information gets lost or, you know, misplaced and you might not even know it. So definitely you want to start reaching out at that point. Uh, the next one is, wait a minute, the thing's jumped around. Uh, I am a widow. I started collecting my husband's social security when I turned 60 this year. My daughter, who's 22 with IDD, was awarded SSDI under her dad before he passed. And then when he passed, we applied for her own uh, social security, which she was awarded, SSDI. Does my widow's social security benefits affect her SSDI? So, so usually what happens is you're not uh, permitted to receive like more than one type of SSDI. You're entitled to the higher amount. So she may become entitled to the widow's amount, which that the survivor's benefit tends to be the highest amount. I didn't touch upon it during the presentation, but um, whereas a parent's retirement or disability usually results in a 50% of the parent's benefit for the child, with a survivor's benefit, it can be up to 75% of what the parent would have received. So it might end up that she switches to the higher benefit amount, but that's something that Social Security would notify you if she becomes eligible for that, but she wouldn't lose SSDI, she just might start, you know, she might become eligible for a higher amount. And what happens if our daughter was originally on SSI, but was switched over years ago to her own SSDI because of her work rec her own work record? Mm -hmm. uh, she has Down syndrome and has been working for 14 years. She's 37 years old, and I will be collecting Social Security shortly. Mm -hmm. so, so like I just mentioned, it's very likely in a lot of cases when when um, the child's been working and they might have their own work record that they're getting SSDI off of, when the parent retires and they become eligible, if the SSDI amount under the parent is going to be higher, then the child will become entitled to that. Just what happens is sometimes, unfortunately, you still do have to do a uh, social security reapplication, but what's going to happen is your child's going to be eligible for that higher amount. Does a DAC on SSDI have to file federal or state taxes? Um, that's a bit of a tricky question because I'm not really a tax expert. <laughs> okay. So we'll hold off on that one. I, I'd consult with a financial advisor there. And um, I worked for the state. 
I'd like to keep my daughter on my private health insurance. What issues might I run into with my daughter having private insurance, Medicaid, Medicare? So uh, like some of the things I mentioned in the presentation, you know, the prescription drug coverage is going to be something you want to think about if looking at, you know, eligible for Medicare, do you want Medicare Part D or do you want to keep the insurance option? So you would have to disenroll from Part D. Remember, keep in mind with Medicare Part B, if she's on Medicaid, it's going to be paid for by the state. So you don't have to necessarily worry about dropping that. Um, but with Sometimes the coordination of coverage can get a little confusing with when someone has Medicaid, Medicare, and private health insurance. You know, I'd always say, make sure you have all the information when you're going for prescriptions or you're going for to get uh, health visits to make sure you're bringing all the information because, you know, sometimes stuff doesn't get billed correctly and you might be on the hook for something. But in a lot of situations, Medicaid as that last pair will pick up many things, even if it's not necessarily covered by Medicare or the private health insurance. So there, there can be definitely some, some pitfalls, just, you know, you want to be on top of things. In 2018, SSA sent letters. If your child lives in your, in the home, uh, you do not have to file an annual report with SSA. Is this the same for DAC SSDI individuals? that you don't have to file a report with- An annual report with Social Security Administration. So it, it's not necessarily with Social Security that you always, always have to file an annual report. Sometimes, you know, there's checks every few years, but, you know, like I mentioned, you're going to want to stay on top of reporting income and, you know, any changes with household, things like that. You know, you don't want to report this to SSA. And what happens if my child no longer receives SSI because she's making too much money, but my husband will be retiring? Will, will it affect here? She receives state Medicaid. If she starts receiving too much for SSI, if she could still become eligible for SSDI under the husband's retirement, I mean, is that it's a little tricky? Like, is SSI being terminated because she makes too much? Well, it said, I'm trying to see. It just says that he's her husband's retiring. Um, okay. Just wants to know how it's going to affect her Medicaid. Oh, okay. Yeah. So if, if she's transitioning from the SSI to SSDI, again, that means she had the Medicaid originally through SSI. And if the SSI is going to be ending, then you're looking at, you have to go through the DAC reapplication process. If she's from DDD, if she's getting services through DDD, it'll be from there. If not, it'll be from the local county board of social services. The My New Jersey Family Care Renewal was always, or this might have been the same one, um, where the renewal was in September in mm -hmm. 23. I received a renewal packet in September. Uh, I got the renewal letter in May as the renewal date changed. So I think that was the same question as before. Okay. Um, can SSDI money be put into an ABLE account, um, be put into a special needs trust once the special needs trust is funded upon death of a parent? Yes, you, you could put SSDI money in there. Okay. And does workability apply to adults enrolled in the disabled in the DAC program? So so workability is it's different from the DAC Medicaid. The the DAC is when someone switches from under the SSI to the SSDI and they start getting the Medicaid because they become eligible as the DAC. The workability is just one of the other ABD Medicaid programs that if they were under that before that they were making too much and they didn't want the income asset limits, then they might have been under the workability program. The main thing to know about if someone either was covered under the workability program or switched to it is just that if they're also receiving SSDI, that they have to keep you know the SGA limit in, a, in mind if they want to keep the SSDI. So some individuals, some families, you know, if the individual is capable of working more and earning more, they don't necessarily want the SSDI or it's not as big a deal. They want their child to be more independent and work more. That can be some circumstances, but if you're someone that wants to 
have your child work, also keep the SSDI benefit. You're going to want to keep that monthly SGA, that $15.50 per month. You want to keep that in mind. Um, the next one is my daughter has been working part time since August 2020. She has always gotten SSDI. The original award letter stated she may be asked to report her wages. She has never been asked, so we have never sent in pay stub copies. She has never, she never went over the gross maximum, and I can go into the pay stub website online to get copies. Should I do that now and send them in, or wait for them to request? I I would send them in instead of potentially waiting. And what if the Medicare premium continues to be deducted? Who can you contact to look into this and correct it? Feel free to reach out to me if it continues to be deducted beyond that two, three months. Okay. And does the ARC have uh, ship counselors? We don't have ship counselors. Uh, we have a very good working relationship with ship and the director. So I'm always happy to refer individuals to ship as well. They're a tremendous resource, but we don't uh, we don't have trained ship counselors on site. And my IDD adult child has SSDI and Medicare, Medicaid, and DDD from his work experience. When my husband and I retire, does anything change as long as he is under the SGA? No, if there's not un any other major changes, then, you know, you're just looking at, you know, switching over the Medicaid as a DAC. But otherwise, if you stay under the SGA, you know, he'll keep receiving the SSDI benefit. Okay, someone said great information. Thank you for that. Let's see. What information is needed for the SSDI application from an ex-spouse who has retired? So it's, I mean, I really recommend going to the Social Security website. There's a lot of things that are needed for it. Um, you, you know, lots of records, statements, previous. It, it's quite, I recommend going to ssa.gov to see the full list of what they're expecting to submit with the retirement information and collecting benefits. Okay. And my workplace is going to have more than 100 employees. Is my son's private insurance going to change to primary instead of secondary? So, so that's not a question I'm gonna be able to answer. That would be a question for your employer. They should be able to help you. Also potentially reaching out to Medicare, whether Medicare or the private health insurance is gonna be primary. The larger the insurer and depending on the health insurance, they may remain primary, but that would be a question for the employer. It's not something I'm gonna be able to answer. And we had approved two years in a row the autism of our adult child. The first year, my son lost his Medicaid due to the mail being delayed. The second year, they put us through an ordeal. It seems like cruel and unnecessary punishment. Will it be every year? The, will every year be the same? So the hope is that not every year will be the same. It will be annual renewals every year. But one of the things that Medicaid has been working on throughout the unwinding is they're trying to automate the process as much as they can. Um, you might have heard the term ex parte renewals is basically automatic renewals. So where they have eligible information that in years past and things haven't changed, they're looking to automate the process and make sure, you know, it's less of a burden on families so if there haven't been any major changes, they want to be able to electronically verify things. And hopefully that means both less administrative burden for the Medicaid office, but also less stress and issues for family and just needing to go back and forth with paperwork and filling things out and things being lost in the mail. So it will be annual renewals, but you know the hope is if you've had bad experiences the past two years, you know, hopefully it'll be better next year and, you know, it should get better as we move further away from the unwinding and it gets more polished with going back to these annual renewals each year as it was pre-pandemic. If you have funded a special needs trust, do you notify Social Security right away or wait until the renewal process? If you're funding a special needs trust, you should be notifying Social Security right away. Uh, my neurodivergent son is 23 and has SSI Medicaid. 
He lives in a campus setting home and has a designation through DDD. He is not able to work and needs continual care. He has SSI and I have not heard of him switching to SSDI. Is that going to happen? I'm still confused about this. Mm -hmm. So Social Security reaches out when the child becomes eligible. And again, it's going to be based on when the parent retires. I've heard of cases where it happens almost instantaneously. And I've also heard of cases where it can be weeks or months. It really seems to depend on Social Security, but they initiate the transition from SSI to SSDI. And, you know, it, it can take some time. I've heard of it, you know, being quite long or being quite short, but um, it, it's really they initiate, they reach out on your child becoming eligible for the SSDI. And going back to SHIP counselors, can you just explain what a SHIP counselor is? Sure. So the New Jersey State Health Insurance Assistance Program, um, these are actually set up in every state, but they are uh, set up to help New Jersey beneficiaries that receive Medicare, or if they're a dual, that they receive Medicare and Medicaid. They are trained counselors who are able to assist. They can do appointments, set up one-on-one -on -one counseling times. If you really have, you know, specific Medicare, Medicaid questions, you know, if you are one, if you're wondering what it looks like enrolling in a Medicare Advantage plan versus a DSNP or, you know, how to weigh your options, those would be things to go to a SHIP counselor about and they would be happy to help. But they're trained professionals, very knowledgeable on helping individuals with Medicare or dual eligibles. And if you have questions about private health insurance with Medicare as well, um, they're very good with that. Um, my son is 22 and has SSI re and uh, received a letter from health insurance about possibility for him to also uh, have Medicare. How do I know this is legitimate? Um, how, how do you know it's legitimate for Medicare? If it's in writing, um, but, you know, could also follow up and call Medicare and they'd be able to look in their system. I know, you know, always be on the lookout for scams or, you know, people trying to, that aren't really from Medicare. You always want to be on the lookout for that. But, you know, it's something you would get in contact with Medicare about if you really want to verify it. My experience with that was I didn't get an explanation letter. We got a Medicare card in the mail. That's how I was notified that my daughter was getting <laughs> Medicare. And I'm like, well, what is this? Am I supposed to get this? So the, okay. So, but that was a, a few years ago, but um, sure. I don't know if there was supposed to be a letter that didn't make it in the envelope. I'm not sure. I, I've heard of a few cases like that. I mean, it's, it's always something, you know, I'd say try to get Medicare a call about and, yeah. you know, verify the information, you know, they'd be able to look up if you're in their system and, Hopefully it's, you know, you always want to hope it's legitimate. Yeah. Uh, is there a requirement to notify uh, Social Security of deposits made into ABLE accounts? So, so there's electronic receipts with the ABLE account. So you'll, you'll have records of that. There will be online records with any, you know, again, like a regular bank account with the ABLE, anything you deposit, withdrawal, there will be receipts of that. So if it's required, if you need to submit it to SSA, it's usually pretty easily to access those records. And uh, another question, my husband is an actor, I'm a writer, so we are not, I wouldn't say this, not normal people, that's what you wrote. And we don't do things like retire. Um, we're either working or not working. Is retirement just age related? Um, is retirement just age related? Well, or would that be, I'm, I'm just thinking, would that be when you hit a certain age, you can collect social security, you might not retire, but get social security. So I don't know. Well, well so as I, I touched upon in the earlier slide, you know, if someone, someone could retire, retire as early as 62 and it's a reduced benefit. Otherwise it, it depends on the birth year or if they wait until at least 70, but um, you know, it's usually at least 65 for the individual to receive Medicare, but um, you know, unless they re retire in a sense and start receiving Social Security benefits, that's what would be required for, you know, the eligible child to become uh, able to start receiving SSDI benefits. So just just so I'm clear on that. So that would be more when Social Security is being collected, not necessarily retire from a job. Yes, but they, they, they would have had to work a job that 
paid into Social okay. Security. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And what if one parent takes um, Social Security before the other parent? When does SSDI happen? So, so again, it, it's hard to say when exactly it happens. It can vary depending on the family when the child becomes eligible. Um, might be weeks, might be months, but so it's best to be prepared for what the DAC process looks like and how your child's benefits might be changing. Well, and I'm thinking it's, it's if one parent, so may, what if there's an age gap between the parents? Sure. And one parent collects social security like years before the other one. Mm -hmm. That I think that's what it is. Like what happens? So, so they'll be eligible for the one benefit. And then I think I touched upon this with some of the earlier questions is if the other parent retires and there's a higher benefit that's up for grabs, okay. what might happen is, you know, you're transitioning from the one parent's SSDI to the other at some point, if the child's potentially eligible for an increase in their benefit. Okay. But would start that process with the first parent collecting SSDI. Yeah, yes, so it, it would start good. with the first parent. Okay, okay. That's all the questions in the Q&A right now. Let me go back through the There chat. were two questions in the chat. One wanted Connor to go into a little bit more detail about the MLTSS designation. Um, if answering that question that you, if you've accidentally put yes, what that looks like. Okay. Um, so yeah, if you want to talk about that one first. Sure. So if you do check it off, yes, then it's not necessarily, it might result in an automatic Medicaid termination, but it might delay the process. And there can be confusion then with New Jersey family here reaching out to you, because basically if you check that off, they think you're looking for consideration for LLTSS. And then, you know, if this is something that happened and you accidentally checked it off, yes, and it's not, I would reach out to the county board social offices to to Medicaid and call them and you know try to get that rectified. But um, you know it's just something that's gonna maybe delay the process some, and ho hopefully it if you get on top of it soon enough, it wouldn't result in outright termination. But um, you know that's the way it goes. Thank you. And mm -hmm. then the other question was, if my child drops Medicare Part B because he has private insurance, what can we do to correct it? So, so you could enroll, you could re-enroll with the Medicare Part B. Um, that's totally available to you. And because they are also covered through Medicaid, there shouldn't necessarily be uh, an enrollment penalty. It should be something that you could pick back up and it shouldn't be a big deduction. But um so, so that should be fine, but it's totally up to the family if they want to pick it back up. If, you know, some families are okay with the private health insurance, it's just generally overall don't recommend necessarily dropping the Part B because it's subsidized through the state and through the Medicaid program. I will have to say my experience contacting Medicare when I separated out the that um, community plan um was very positive like they were they were very helpful and um the person on the line was able to to take care of my issue and we got everything squared away and and it was a pretty quick process so um that was my experience so i hope everyone has that kind of experience when they're contacting medicare that's good to hear lots of um thank yous and thank you for the information and um lots to digest <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and, and yeah, and thank you for sharing the slides and the reporting, because I know for myself, I'm, you know, I need to go back and, and uh, look through these, you know, piece by piece and be able to have that recording to listen to the explanations um, over and over again. So we uh, so appreciate you being here with us tonight. Thank you for taking your time with us this evening. Um, and is there anything else from anybody else? They're all saying thank you. Uh, I think that's, yeah, and, and Carrie put in the, if you want to know more about the Regional Family Support Planning Councils, the she put the link in the chat. So um, we have 10 councils across the state. So if you're not in our council, there is a council for you in whichever county 
uh, you live in and you can find that information at that website. All right, well, thank you so much, everyone. It was a, a great presentation. Um, have a great rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.